will noch zugeben, ein kurzes Wort. Wer es kennt schon im Aleichems Brief, weiß, dass er hat gehört eine Idee fix, Mäzenaten. Er hat ständig gewollt, haben Mäzenaten und er ist ständig wenn enttäuscht von dem, was er hat nicht gefunden hat, kein Mäzenaten. Und heute, wir können heute feiern in Asafanem, schon im Aleichem, ist es keinem Kohl, dank zwei Menschen, was mir das Tamot keiner von euch sei nicht gekannt, aber mir dürfen sie der Monen. Keinem Kohl Israel Solovei, was Adang der Jerusche, was er hat abgeschrieben, Beit Sholem Aleichem, mit Jorn Zurich, kennt Beit Sholem Aleichem durch für seine Funktion. Der zweite Name ist Avrom Itzchok Lerner, was Adang der Jerusche, was er hat abgeschrieben, dem Yiddish Hauptteil in Jerusalemer Universität, ob mir gekannt, anheben dem Projekt von der Yiddischer Periodik und andere Yiddish Projekten. Ich darf mir gesehen der Monen oder dem Fakt und mir dürfen sich gesehen der Anstrengen zu gefinden noch Mäzenaten. Efscher will mir sie gefinden. Und jetzt ist er freut, rübergehen von unseren Kollegen zu unseren Lehrers. Koidem Kohl, Ruth Weiss, unser Lehrer, was hat eingegliedert dem Analyse von Sholem Aleichems Werk in ihre Keulaldike Werk auf Englisch, The Modern Jewish Canon, und jetzt das Buch No Joke. Und ich gedenke ganz gut, wie wir haben sich noch gelernt mit Jörn Zurich Sholem Aleichems Erzählungen in einem Kurs in Givatram. Ruth, sei so gut. Well, <coughs> I am extremely moved to be here and I cannot start without first saying that I am the daughter of a mezenatke of Yiddish. My brother and I have had that fortune, so uh, unfortunately we cannot contribute to Yiddish literature in the form that my mother did, <laughs> so we do it in our own way. Um, I am very grateful to the organizers of this conference, which has been organized stupendously, And I thank them for having invited me to participate in it. And particularly, I have the good fortune to be here with Don Miron um, sharing this evening. We met as graduate students um, at Columbia University. So you see that the realm of Yiddish really goes even beyond the Hebrew University. But um, more than anything else, I'm glad to be here in this place because if I have any idea of what Gan Eden would be like, and I did imagine to myself, what, what would I, how would I imagine in 120 years going to Gan Eden? My idea of Gan Eden is the Judaica reading room of the Hebrew <laughs> University Library. Um, so, since Tevye der Milchiker was never meant to stop talking, we need never stop talking about Tevye. One of the most original creations in world literature, a character who leaves and returns nine times in 20 years. He is at once the quintessential Jew and the most universally popular Jewish literary character, I think, since the Bible. In the courses I taught on modern Jewish fiction that included authors from Isaac Babel to Saul Bellow, Franz Kafka to Primo Levi, Agnon to Amos Oz, and Frank to Cynthia Ozick, the favorite work was always Sholem Aleichem's Tevye the Dairyman. So I think Tevye's appeal is obvious. He has wonderful qualities. Before he became a dairyman, he is already a milchiker, filled with the milk of human kindness. In Jewish iconography, the most basic distinction is between milchik and fleshik. Tevye is not parev, He is milchik, liberal, generous, and considerate, as opposed to other men in his stories, like the lustful butcher, the domineering priest, the nouveau riche son-in-law. In his first story, tired out as he is after a day of heavy labor, discouraged by his failure to feed his family, and initially frightened by two apparitions in the forest, he soon recognizes that they are women, Jews like himself, and he gives in to the appeal of this mother and daughter to turn his wagon around and to bring them home to their family. He does not negotiate a price for his labor, as one might expect him to do if he were calculating a commercial transaction. 
So he experiences his reward as dos große Gewinns, lottery's big win, or God's answer to his recent prayers. In a British novel, we would have called his action gentlemanly. In Tevye's world, his action is that and more. He takes God as his model for proper behavior, and although he complains that God is not living up to his promises, Tevye acts as a considerate human being. The saying of his that offends some feminists, Tevye is nit ken jidene, stifles some tender sentiment that threatens to make him even more of a softy than he already is. So Tevye was created in the mid-1890s at a time of great dissatisfaction with Jewish life. In temperament and in other qualities, Tevye is the corrective, the better alternative to some of the alleged failings of the traditional Jewish men of his time as that criticism was leveled by both Jewish enlighteners and surrounding Europeans. First, he assumes masculine responsibility for women in distress at a time when the status of women was almost a con as contentious as an, an issue as it is today, at least where I live. Three years before Tevye came on the scene, Yud Lamet Peretz gave us the story of mental brainess, a Jew whose reputation for piety is achieved at the expense of his wife. Mendel is also generous and known for his good deeds, but his wife is the one who pays the price for them by having to earn the money that he donates to charities, and the burdens that she assumes cause her premature death. Jewish reformers at the end of the 19th century were intent on getting husbands to support their families, not unlike the criticism that is leveled at Haredi men today, whether fairly or unfairly. Tevye is an observant Jew who proves his goodness by supporting his family. When he rescues the women who were lost in the woods, the husband and father offer him brandy. He, he gratefully downs it. A bissel bromfen? Wer sagt gropfen a bissel bromfen? Wie steht dort in Posik? Ezel achaim, ve ezel amovis. He doesn't turn down the brandy. But once he has had his little drink and his little joke, he declines the food, and instead he lets the balabos know that his wife and children are at home hungry. The wealthy vacationers get the point. They load up his wagon with plenty of food and um, for his family. So I would say it's admittedly manipulative of Tevye to mention his hungry family after this reunited family has feasted at their dinner table. But for the time being, he remains hungry. Tevye makes sure that his horse has eaten before getting back on the road. He, however, does not eat before his wife and daughters have been fed. Secondly, we are introduced to Tevye when he is earning his living and supporting a large family. One can hardly exaggerate the importance of this at a time when, according to some historian, 40% of Russian Jewish males were Luftmenschen, that is, persons with no steady or identifiable form of income. As we know, Sholem Aleichem had just created such a Luftmensch in Menachem Mendel, who leaves his wife and family and does not return to them. And a less humorous treatment of the departed father and husband is Sholem Aleichem's lullaby, Schlaf mein Kind, mein Trest, mein Schöner, whose singer addresses her infant Kaddish, telling him that he will someday understand that she is crying because his father has gone off to America. So inept, irresponsible, exploitative, or simply absent, Jewish men were being charged with failure to protect their women and children. Jewish political movements were rousing Jews to take charge of their self-defense. You th need think only of Bialik's response to the Kishinev pogrom. The philosopher and baptized Jew Otto Weininger wrote that Jewish men were feminized, that they manifested the extreme of cowardliness, which he did not mean as a compliment. Thus, a man in charge of a household of women who brings home the money to set them up in the dairy business, and then works to support them for the rest of his life, is the Yiddish Sir Galahad of his age. And that Tevye 
like any peasant can, ma can navigate the territory between village and city with his horse and wagon, is also not to be taken for granted in a literature that mocked the Jews for not knowing the difference between the Sambatnion and the Dnieper. Thirdly, this is not even the half of it. Some reformers attacked the Jewish male for earning a living by exploiting others. We are not yet so far removed from applied Marxism to forget the intelligentsia's war on middlemen who bring producer to consumer, seller to buyer, people to market, and markets to people. Communism set out to eradicate this parasitic sector of society. But sociologically, economically, politically, and conceptually, Jews were the essential middlemen, members of a self-defined minority who made their living and proved their worth by negotiating among larger nations. How then can a Jew earn like a man without being condemned as a middleman? Tevye solves this conundrum by producing what he sells and selling only what he produces. He is a peddler to be sure, but not of books or clothing, not like other Shalom Aleichem characters of pieces of paper, but of fresh dairy products, milked by his own wife and children from his own cows on his own form farmstead. He himself loads his goods onto the wagon and delivers them to his customers. Shalom Aleichem's genius was to produce in Tevye a middleman whom the Marxists could not entirely discredit, though of course they did try. Fourthly, though he is sometimes mischaracterized as a shtetl Jew, central to Tevye's appeal is that he is not a shtetl Jew at a time when the shtetl was under attack for its parochialism, its dead economy, for combining the worst of rural ignorance and urban blight. The indictment of townspeople and despoilers of nature was as strong at the end of the 19th century as the environmentalist movement is today. Tolstoyans, Rousseauists, Polish romantics, and Zionist agriculturists promoted healthier reconnection with the natural world. Tevye does not live in Anatevka. He's a yeshuvnik, a homesteader who lives on the land on good terms with his animals and always outdoors. Here he sits outside his house at the end of Sukkot on Hoshana Rabbah. This is my favorite season, and I'll just read it in English to show you that not everything is necessarily lost in translation. Each day is a gift. The sun's not as hot as an oven anymore and has a mildness about it that makes being out of doors a pleasure. The leaves are still green, the pine trees give off a good tarry smell, and the whole forest is looking at its best as if it were God's own sukkah, a tabernacle for God. It's there that he must celebrate the holiday, not in the city, where there's such a commotion of people running about to earn their next meal, and so on. So contrast this with the original peddler with the horse and wagon, Mendel Moichers Forum, who suffers from hemorrhoids and goes into mourning during the weeks before Tisha B'Av, while the whole world around him is in full bloom. In his rural self-sufficiency, Tevye already resembles the settlers in Rishon LeZion in more, far more than those Jews in the Pale of Settlement. He is the milk portion of the land of milk and honey, and Sholem Aleichem would have moved him to Eretz Yisroel if he had been able to carry out his plan of visiting there himself. Tevye is on his way here at the end of the seventh episode in 1909, and only the bankruptcy of his fourth son-in-law keeps him in Russia until the expulsion order that comes five years later. So we have a breadwinning and protective husband and father, a middleman who sells only what he produces, and an ecologically balanced dairy farmer at, at home in the natural world. Tevye has something in common with Mordechai Spector's Yiddisher Muzik and the muscular Jews of a whole generation of younger Yiddish and Hebrew writers who were challenging the negative stereotype of the unproductive Jewish scholar. But here's the twist. The negation of the Jewish stereotype would have been no more than a goy if he were not simultaneously wholly recognizable as a Jew. 
Sholem Aleichem's most artful Yiddish speaker, Yiddish male speaker, had to counteract the Jewish stereotype from within the culture. So Sholem Aleichem's liberal redemption of the traditional Jewish male had to prove itself in the folk speech of a traditional Jewish male. Fifthly, Shelton Harnick, the man who wrote the lyrics for Fiddler on the Roof, said that when he was writing the musical, they found the key to the production with the opening song, Tradition. The American adaptation introduces the papa, the mama, the daughters, and all the other fixed characters of a safely remote time in a presumably simpler world. Who day and night must scramble for a living, feed a wife and children, say his daily prayers, and who has the right as master of the house to have the final word at home? The papa, the papa, I think you all know even, you know, in whatever language. The papa, tradition, that's the word that sold it to them. Well, Tevye is so observant that he doesn't forget to daven mincha even when he's alone in the forest with only his horse as the only human witness. And that joke is Tevye's. But he redefines the image and the spirit of tradition. He uses the prayers to complain to God about how slow he is in fulfilling his promises. Tevye quotes so obsessively from the sources that his wife Golda, his daughters, the matchmaker, and everyone who comes into contact with him says at some point, enough already. But whereas people normally offer quotations to shore up their arguments, Tevye inverts, subverts, puns, and otherwise distorts quotations to demonstrate his wit and deeper other meaning. Tevye shows off his Jewish literacy, not through Bikias, not through erudition, but through his improvisational skill. That is why I've called him a comical Rashi. He comments on the sources from the new perspective of a Volksmensch, an exceptionally uncommon common Jew. So one final way in which Tevye revises the negative image of the Jew is by changing Sholem Aleichem's own satiric portraits. We could illustrate a whole textbook of abnormal psychology with the narrators of Sholem Aleichem's stories. I have here a longer list, but I will shorten them. The monologists, right, whose um, convolutions are so obsessive aggressive that they drive their listeners to faint dead away or to want to commit murder. And then Menachem Mendel's letters. How about their Kafakishev der Schneider, uh, who is stuck in a pattern of behavior he cannot understand and is therefore condemned to repeat that pattern to the point of madness. What about Sholem Shachne of Eber Ahitl, uh, who literally loses his head? So Sholem Aleichem's monologues dramatize every one of these uh, characters, and uh, Don Miron, for example, has shown us how unreliably speakers tell us their stories, whether manipulating others or in self-delusion. So Tevye is the corrective to such portraits, by no means perfect, but under the circumstances, a balanced human being. Tevye is different from other Sholem Aleichem characters, how? And here I think uh, the point is this, he does not just speak, and I'm, David Roskies has written now wonderfully about Tevye's speech, um, and this is of course the main thing about him, but he does not just speak. Tevye differs because he communicates with Sholem Aleichem. The difference between speech and communication is the running theme of his stories. Like Menachem Mendel, Tevye originally introduces himself in a letter with the formulaic salutation of letter writing manuals, zu mein geliebten teuren Freund Reb Sholem Aleichem, Gott soll euch geben gesund und parnosse mit eurer Weib und Kinder. So you think it's going to be the same play between the, the, the uh, um, box of the, of the um, letter and the freedom of speech, but it isn't that. Um, when Hillel Halkin translated this work into English, he consigned the letter to an explanatory footnote because Halkin felt that Sholem Aleichem no longer needed the scaffolding once he had erected the building. In other words, once Tevye was launched on his spoken stories. But if we care about intention, knowing what the author intended his character to be, the letter establishes the basis of this fictional transaction between a writer 
and his subject and the reciprocal relations between two social non-equals that is the bedrock of everything that follows. Tevye is the mainstay of a literary project, of a literary culture, a Jew collaborating with another to tell a national story in a disintegrating world. Tevye and Sholem Aleichem can constitute a miniature Jewish territory where together they reassert moral control over everything that they endure. So Tevye introduces himself as Katointi from the much commented on verse in Vayishlach when Jacob says, Katointi mikol achasodim asher osiso esavdecha. I am unworthy of all the kindness that you have so steadfastly shown your servant. And there's a lot of irony in this application. But Tevye presents himself as Sholem Aleichem's inferior and beneficiary, limited in his learning and threatened by the Tsar as Jacob is by Esau, confined to the Pale of Settlement, whereas Sholem Aleichem has the right to reside in the big city. Ah, but who actually benefits whom in this arrangement? Tevye authors the story that Sholem Aleichem merely appropriates. Sholem Aleichem has discovered an entertainer so captivating that he will bring his stories to the public as a kind of advertisement that will help Tevye distribute his products while Sholem Aleichem earns his living off this rural dairy man. Without Tevye, Sholem Aleichem would starve for material. Right? So while the letter becomes extraneous once the Tevye stories get underway, it establishes their collaboration. A relatively cohesive community is being torn by Tsarist decrees that confine some Jews to the Pale of Settlement and permit others to, uh, to live in Kiev, that limit the number of Jews who can attend college, leaving some unable to compete on equal terms. In every new episode, Tevye confronts a more serious rupture than the one before. Unraveling rabbinic authority in that time meant that national cohesion could no longer be dictated from above. So Tevye, through Sholem Aleichem, tries to provide its democratic cohesion from below. We take it for granted that Jews can survive attacks from the outside. Shebechol dor vador omdim aleinu But they must now face the revolt of their own children. And that is what Tevye is there to show how the Jew reacts and how the Jew can handle this. So that is how communication becomes the main theme of Tevye's stories. The interaction between the speaker and the author holds firm through two decades of changes and setbacks which involve misunderstanding, concealment, suppressed information, fabrication, double entendres, threat, and much worse. I think a whole book uh, can be written about this subject. I'm just going to offer three the most familiar uh, examples. One day, Tevye is informed by his wife that he is urgently wanted by Laser Wolf the butcher. Shalom <laughs> Tevye immediately assumes that the only thing a butcher could want with a dairy farmer is his cow. And Tevye is damned if he will bring one of his animals to slaughter. He doesn't like the butcher, he dislikes his occupation, and his coarse nature. Nonetheless, Tevye goes to town, and since Laser Wolf happens to be at the slaughterhouse, he's ushered into the widower's home, and he's asked to wait there. One of the best ways to tell a story, if you've ever tried this art, is to tell it at one's own expense. And Tevye does this to perfection. As he recounts their conversation, the reader realizes that while Tevye assumes that they are discussing the sale of a cow, the butcher, of course, is angling to marry Tevye's oldest daughter. The standard, standard comic misunderstanding reveals that the men have, in fact, been commodifying the daughter as though she were a farm animal, whereas all the while, Seitel, the eldest daughter, has been conducting her own romance in human form. So after this, Tevye comes to recognize Seitel's right to self-determination, and he uses the art of miscommunication creatively to placate his wife, 
who was eager to see her daughter settled in the material comfort of the butcher's home. So the next story involves more serious miscommunication. Tevye is, of course, delighted to meet the young man, Pfefferl, who has ideas about income inequality that resemble his own complaints about being poor while other Jews are so much wealthier. Tevye fails to grasp that the younger man's radical ideology sub substitutes enforced egalitarianism for Jewish mutual interdependency, two very different things. Pfefferl intends to ensure that the estates of the rich will be yours and mine and everyone's someday. The boy radicalizes Tevye's second daughter, Hoddle, and the two conspire to join the revolution. Papa, you don't understand is the refrain of this story that is heavy with dramatic irony as the reader understands the political undercurrents that the father does not. The two youngsters are conspirators, not only against Tsarism, but against the Jewish way of life. We may sympathize with these revolutionaries, but their secretive plotting signals that they are going to decamp from the Jewish family and from the Jewish people. Hence, Hoddle's departure at the end of the story triggers the most famous of Tevye's taglines. You know what, Pani Sholem Aleichem, let's talk about something more cheerful. Have you heard any news of the cholera in Odessa? So let no one suppose that Sholem Aleichem failed to recognize the pandemic consequences of communism's attraction for the Jews. The joke about cholera is that that is to what it is comparable, that he is suffering only worse. Huddle's departure is much more serious than Seidel's bid for independence, and the third daughter, Chava's defection, overshadows even Huddle's. Communication in Chava is shut down first from one side and then from the other, but not before Chava gets the better of her father in conversation. God says, my Chava created us all equal, so he did, I say. He created man in his likeness. But you had better remember that not every likeness is alike. Ish kematnas yodoi, as the Bible says. It's beyond belief, she says, how you have a verse from the Bible for everything. Maybe you also have one that explains why human beings have to be divided into Jews and Christians, masters and slaves, beggars and millionaires. Now, in recounting this conversation with his daughter, Tevye not only admits her powers of persuasion, but shows himself intellectually unable to muster the arguments that might have persuaded her to remain a Jew. If it comes down to this type of argument, Tevye seems to concede that Judaism does not stand a chance. And you will note in this work that there is no place in this work where through his speech, um, by his example, of course, yes, but in his speech, Tevye never undertakes and is never able to do what the rabbis do in the synagogue sometimes to try to persuade us why Judaism is um, such a worthy civilization. So until this point, Tevye's speech has been the instrument of his sanity. Whatever he cannot control in action, he absorbs through creative reaction, turning defeat into verbal victory, humiliation into verbal triumph, loss into psychological gain. The art of interpretation is the key to this creative survival. And Tevye, if you will forgive the pun, can irony out any challenge. Yet at the heart of Mount Torah Mesinai, at the heart of Jewish peoplehood, is the negative, no, thou shalt not, that is an irreducible part of what Jewish civilization aspires to be. Aspires to be. So Sholem Aleichem created Tevye in the liberal image of his age to show how far the traditional Jew could bend to accommodate modernity, feminism, socialism, theological skepticism. But just when you think that the Jew must, might be a schmate blowing in the wind, he steals himself. And ambivalent as he is, and boy is he ambivalent, he says no 
to his dearest daughter. No, he will not accept her conversion and her marriage to a Ukrainian Christian. He does not stop for her on the road when she wants to make it up with him and to hold on to him as a father. This is one of the most remarkable passages in modern Jewish fiction, precisely because Tevye is such a milk, such a milchiker, such a milk toast, so accommodating in his instincts. Here he confronts what is for Sholem Aleichem the pivotal is issue. How much does staying a Jew really matter? Chava says it doesn't matter at all. Judaism says it is essential. So only when we see how Sholem Aleichem stacks the deck against a Jewish father can we appreciate the potency of Tevye's act. The intellectual arguments are all on Chava's side, acknowledging the clear liberal preference for universalism over particularism. Tevye faces the dilemma of a father who millennia after Abraham is still being asked to sacrifice his beloved child to his own demanding discipline. Moreover, Chvetka is described as a second Gorky, and since we know how very much the author appreciated the first Gorky, there can be no higher commendation. Chvetka is the liberal element within the anti-Semitic regime. Most compelling is how minutely Tevye conveys to Sholem Aleichem his internal struggle, which is the very opposite of self-justification. The words karachem of albonim kept running through my head. Could there be anywhere a child so bad that a father couldn't love it? What torture to think that I was the only exception. Why a monster like me wasn't fit to walk the earth. I tell you, I had even weirder thoughts than that in the forest. What did being a Jew or not a Jew matter, exactly Chava's words to him. Why did God have to create both? And if he did, why put such walls between them so that neither would look at the other even though both were his creatures? It grieved me that I wasn't a more learned man because surely there were answers to be found in the holy books. You see, Tevye wishes that he were Franz Rosenzweig, but even Rosenzweig remained a Jew because of the example of the Jews he saw in the synagogue who insisted on staying and praying as Jews. Tevye's resistance is the more impressive because of the substance of his self-doubt to which you referred. But this pivotal chapter of the Tevye stories hinges on his decision not to yield. Humor has its limits and he must choose to be or not to be a Jew and he chooses for the Jewish people his refusal to speak is the most eloquent moment in this work. And at this point, I think Tevye becomes a tragic hero. He shows the power and the will to resist, and he pays full price for his resistance. In the spirit of the times, Sholem Aleichem created in Tevye an accommodating, open-minded, ironic Jew who is always ready to see the other side of an argument, to say yes to any humanistic impulse, the character was never supposed to slip into karet, the fatal punishment of cutting someone off from the Jewish people, or alternately, cutting himself off from the freedoms of modernity. And then the logic of Jewish existence brought the author and the character up against the classic Russia of the Haggadah, who in modern times comes more often in the form of a daughter than a son. Tevye answers as the Haggadah answers the Russia, dismissing the child who dismisses his people. And you see that Tevye finds it much easier to stand up to the priest, and he will find it easier to stand up to the neighbors who come to expel him than to close the door on one of his own children. Uh, since I must now head to conclusion, I suggest that from this point on, Tevye's stories of loss and sadness reverse the sunnier atmosphere of the earlier episodes. Sprinze dies, Golda dies, Motel Kamsoil dies, Belka leaps for America, which is represented here as an end to the source-driven Jewishness that Tevye embodies. Worse than death is the decline in communication among the living. The story of Sprinze is a mirror inversion of the opening episode, where instead of helping Tevye and his family to economic self-sufficiency, the wealthy Jew accuses Tevye 
of pimping, pimping for his daughter, and creates conditions for Sprintz's suicide. Belke's motto, the age of Belke is not the age of Huddle, warns that cynicism and material calculations have overtaken the pre-revolutionary idealism at the beginning of the 20th century. Bailke's intention of helping her father through wealth alone backfires and leaves Tevye neither, well, neither wealthy nor any more secure. All he can do is to, ma excuse me, is to match his son-in-law Padotzer, insult for insult, humiliation for humiliation. And he tries to do the same with the Ukrainian neighbors who come to drive him off his homestead. But if ever a text accurately foretells historical events, Tevye's political impotence, when faced with pogrom and eviction, records the fate of Ukrainian Jews. The final chapter of Tevye is by far the strangest. It is so strange that once again, I think our finest English translator, Hillel Halkin, omitted it this time by combining it with the preceding chapter, rather than having it stand on its own. The chapter feels both incomplete and redundant, since a dramatic resolution had already been reached when Chava left her husband and returned home to be reunited with her father at the point the Jews were being driven out. Sholem Aleichem and his wife had settled in New York in 1914, but his son, Misha, died in Europe before he was able to join his parents. In his darkening years, Sholem Aleichem wanted to return to his beloved Tevye, but he could only recall him at that same point of separation, of being exiled as part of a mass exodus from Russian border towns and villages. So the chapter has a funny title, the Chalak Lakois, that appears but once in the Bible in the very aggressive 36th Psalm. O Lord, Strive with my adversaries, give battle to my foes, and let their path be dark and slippery, the la kois, and with the Lord's angel in pursuit. So God is called upon to take vengeance on those whom the Jew cannot defeat on his own. Tevye concocts a challenge to his adversaries, daring them to pronounce this word, and when they fail to do so and they lose the bet, they agree to stage a mini rather than a maxi pogrom, and only to knock out some of the windows to satisfy their mandate. But Tevye's cleverness cannot save him from being expelled from his native land. Do we think that the end of European Jewry came at the end, uh, during World War II? Not according to this. Tevye experiences on the eve of World War I. If anything, this episode shows that although Tevye can maintain his moral equilibrium and even a remnant of his family, he cannot affect their rescue. Now, Tevye has changed a great deal in the 20 years since his first appearance. The man, if you remember, who introduced himself as Kotointi, humbling himself before a more learned Mr. Sholem Aleichem and perhaps a more learned readership, now spends two pages acknowledging that in all humility, he knows more of the Jewish sources than his fellow Jews. The intervening decades have brought about such a change in Yiddish readership that they are no likely to get the joke of chalak lakois than the Gentile peasants whom he is tripping up with this word. Tevye now addresses Sholem Aleichem as the only one who will catch his humor, as opposed to those who have reached America and are unlikely to know any Chumash or Rashi or the 36th Psalm. Tevye's wit, his speech, has gone from being the main source of his appeal to a potential liability in what Shalom Aleichem has to sell. And likewise, the man who once complained to God of being poor while his fellow Jews who are rich now does just the opposite. And he asks, why should his fate be any different from that of his fellow Jews? Mit was bin ich das mehr ben Jochid bei dem Rabbeinische Leulam von alle andere Achenu Bnei Israel? How am I any more favored by God than all our other fellow Jews whom soldiers are forcing out of their sacred villages and so forth? So Tevye here wraps himself entirely in the fate of Kalal Yisroel, the Jewish people in its entirety. 
the national imperative of survival has superseded any thoughts of modernizing reform. So there is a sign here, Tevye still expects Shalom Aleichem to appreciate his irony that allows him to balance faith and doubt, affirmation and skepticism. And um, he could give you examples here, but I think that I um, reached the end of my, uh, my allotted time here. And, um, and the example that he brings shows basically that as tireless as the Jews are reminding God of his people, is that's exactly how relentless the enemies of the Jews are in seeking their destruction. It's this kind of comparison that is what Jews call lachen mit yashchikes, laughing with lizards. The humor that once secured Tevye's moral balance and that still connects him with Sholem Aleichem has not been able to connect him with his children and cannot work against the kind of enmity that the Jew confronts. So Tevye cannot give up his habit of playing against the sources because that is his very Jewish nature, but he knows when his appeal is wearing out. So reduced at the end to far less than he was at his sparkling zenith, he takes his leave of Sholem Aleichem, uncertain where or when they will meet again, unless der Euberster, unless God looks down and says, you know what, children? I've decided to bring you Moshiach. Would that he did that to spite us, our old Rabboni Shaloylam. But meanwhile, have a safe trip and tell our Jews out there not to worry. Unser alter Gott lebt. That's how the work concludes. So what Tevye does in this chapter? Back to the basics. Reaffirm the differences between Jews and Gentiles, his faith in Netzach Yisroel, the eternity of Israel, under the God of Israel. And so I suggest that on this occasion, certainly, maybe we too drop our irony for the moment, and we see that we're Sholem Aleichem here among us. A century after he had written these words, he might have said, Weißt ihr was, Kinderlach? Ihr habt uns schon gebracht, das Stickel Moschiach. You have brought Tevye a home to where his family and he could raise their heads. A broche of Eich. May you be blessed. Thank you.